She joined with her eldest daughter, Winona, to top the charts, and they became one of the most successful country music acts of all time. But before she found success in the entertainment, used mother of two working long hours for little pay, struggling for security for herself and her children, and clinging to the dream that there would be better days ahead. Many years later, while the Judds were at the top of their game, life threw her another curveball, a diagnosis of hepatitis C. She was forced to retire from music, but never gave up. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Grammy-winning recording artist, actress, author, and motivational speaker, Naomi Judd. find that nurturing is something that's just innate within individuals or is it something they learn? Hmm. Uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Francis Collins, he's now head of the NIH, decoded the human genome and we learned so much about nature versus nurture and I honestly think that genetically um, because of reports of my family when I was a little girl I was this way. I was the one who would take kids their homework uh, if they were sick. Mm -hmm. So I think most nurses would tell you that there was also a, a significant experience in their early life. For me, it was the death of my little brother. I felt um, desperately hopeless yeah. and helpless that I couldn't, I couldn't help him. He passed of Hodgkin's disease. But I'm one of those people that I can't stand suffering. I have to do something. Yeah. When you talk about being a nurse, mm. nursing came after a traumatic period in your life. Mm -hmm. Had you not gone through the situation you had through, do you think you would have headed toward nursing? I think uh, one of the reasons I love nursing and was so drawn to it is it doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter how much you weigh and it's one-on-one -on -one. and I preferred ICU I see you <laughs> because not only was it intense and I've got that kind of personality but also um, I would get to know everything about you and it was fascinating to me that you would tell me your life story things that maybe your your spouse that no one else knew because when you're flattened and maybe facing your own mortality it's uh, it was an exquisite privilege, and I've birthed babies. I've also held people who were dying at that passage, and I learned more about myself and human behavior being an RN, and it really prepared me to become a communicator and an artist. Yeah. Why I may artist? have sold out the Astrodome, but I've also <laughs> emptied my share of bedpans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you talk about the career that then mm. follows, ever miss nursing when you're charting albums, touring and all that? Was there ever the loss of being in those I've situations? I've always been a nurse. Um, I'm on the lecture circuit. I speak about mental health a lot because that's one of my grand passions. Um, I have mood disorder. I have serious depression. So I've certainly investigated that. Um, and I want to get rid of the stigma of mental illness. But I also speak at a lot of hospitals, a lot of, um, well, I'm very interested in I study neuroscience, yeah. the brain, and the fascinating things that are going on right now in research. So I'm very involved. Yeah, but even during the, the heavy touring days, the 80s and things like that, miss the actual opportunity to be the nurse in the room. Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden you become Naomi Judd. Does that change your interactions with people, did you find? Yes. I mean, people would literally come up to me and say, does this look infected? <laughs> <laughs> so you never escape well, nursing. <laughs> and they literally would surround the bus at night after a concert and want to come up on the bus and um, talk to me about what they were going through. They'd just been diagnosed with hepatitis C, which I survived. And in fact, a lot of my research and my study um, was because of my hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. I love being a nurse, but 
as I began to study the ways that people heal and the connection, and I'm talking about placebo-based double-blind clinical trials because I'm not going to tell you something that I haven't discovered myself, um, that I haven't used personally, um, sit through a lot of boring slideshows and met a lot of interesting people. So there's an affinity yeah. with medical personnel. The minute I meet someone who's a doctor, a nurse, um, biophysicist, molecular biologist, um, I just go into a trance. It's like, tell me more. Yeah. <laughs> What's your research? What are you learning? Because right now, what's going on out there will blow your mind. Yeah. You talk about your circle of friends and how mm -hmm. it's changed since the heydays of music to who you are today, and mm -hmm. that you've shifted who are your, your close intimates. Mm -hmm. Talk a little about that. Well, when I was touring, um, I would have said that my gal pals, and I still consider them that, were um, Dolly and Reba, uh, Tammy Wynette, before she passed, was my best friend. Um, certainly Martina McBride has been out to my farm, but um, they're all so stinking busy <laughs> that, for instance, they don't know where my silverware drawer is. <laughs> my, my girlfriends today, and I call them my psychologists, my, we're the ah -yah sisterhood. Yeah. Um, we know our way around each other's kitchens. We know everything about each other. And one of the things I learned in neuroscience is that we are hardwired. Our brains are literally hardwired, our neural nets, to have relationships. And at least seven a week that are meaningful, or we wind up on Jerry Springer or something. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about the group of friends, though, the ones that you hang with now, mm. are a lot of people are into research and science and medicine and all of that. Do you ever think to yourself, wow, I'm lucky to be here getting this information from these folks? I am so privileged. And if it wasn't for the fans who changed my life, um, they gave me mobility and um, a platform that I take very seriously. But um, yeah, I mean, I now have Nobel Prize winning physicist friends, Dr. Bill Phillips. Um, who won the Nobel for his work with lasers. Certainly Dr. Leon Letterman, who ran Fermilab. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they've been to my home. <laughs> they stay with me. All these people are so creative, and the thing I found is that they have a childlike wonderment. Mm -hmm. I didn't know when I met these people. I thought, are they gonna have bulging frontal lobes or forget <laughs> to put their pants on? <laughs> But it turns out that, um, and I'm very interested in physics, especially quantum physics. And the more I learn about it, the more I want to learn. Yeah. Let me take you back for a minute again. It's the early 90s, 1990, top of your career, mm -hmm. and they tell you you have hep C, mm -hmm. which a lot of people would assume a death sentence right away. Mm -hmm. How do you process that? What happens to you, and what do you learn from that situation that helps with other people in the future? Um, compassion. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to be a nurse and to be a simpatico and to empathize. And obviously, I would get very close to my patients. Um, I was the kind of nurse that would go home after my shift and then call later to see how they were doing. Um, but. When I was told I had three years to live, um, and I was critically ill, so I wasn't right-minded. Um, hepatitis C is going to kill four times more Americans than AIDS will. It's a silent killer. I somehow knew on a deeply intuitive, almost proto-mammalian part of my brain and my soul that I was going to beat it. Really? I did. And nobody around me believed it. Nobody got it. I literally had to tell Winona and Ashley and my husband Larry with the psychiatrist present because everybody flipped out. Oh, yeah. They thought I was Superwoman. But um, 
I somehow started asking questions. And Dr. Blair Justice, who's here a psychologist at the University of Texas Health and Sciences Department, was one of the first mentors, and he really encouraged me to go where my questions led me because I was on my own. And as I started studying neuropeptides, I learned a lot from Dr. Candace Pert, who's a biophysicist and discovered neuropeptides in 1986 about how the brain is like Walgreens. It's a pharmacy. The brain is an organ. It's three pounds, maybe in your case four. Yeah, probably two and a half. <laughs> oh, Ernie. <laughs> but um, the brain is a drugstore, and our mind is the information control tower. The, the mind and our mental choices and our emotions and our, our thoughts tell the brain what to make, what to produce, and then um, we get that cascade, that chemical cascade of the good hormones and the good neurochemicals, neuropeptides. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a very short version, but they stimulate your body's beleaguered immune system. And like I said, I've actually seen, I can describe that molecular, that um, it increases the immune process. It also lowers your stress. Stress causes cortisol, which is a very negative hormone. It depletes your immune system, and um, so it decreases stress. And I studied all the different things that I could do on an integrative process, biofeedback, chiropractic, music, massage, meditation, um, and the list goes on. And these are all things that make you feel in control more. You're certainly feeling out of control with the prognosis. And right. I think, by the way, anytime a doctor gives you a grim prognosis like that, it's a medical curse. It's a hex. Mm -hmm. And I call it mental malpractice. They have no right because your body believes everything you tell it. We take that then the power of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. The simple idea that if you believe, like you did, that you were going to beat it, mm -hmm. you've already got a leg up. Absolutely. Yeah. And like I said, I can describe this um, on a scientific basis, but it's very true that um, our belief becomes our biology. So every day, even though I felt like crap, mm -hmm. you feel like you've got the world's worst case of the flu and you go to bed, when you wake up the next morning, you still feel the same way. But hepatitis C causes systemic depression and then being out of your life causes depression. So I always advocate with the hepatologists that I work with that you have to prescribe an antidepressant. I'm a minimalist when it comes to medication, but we have to raise our hand and say, I need help. Yeah. I need to get myself on a level playing field so that all of these other um, beliefs and practices, simple practices, um, can be utilized but we know the body moves along the path of its expectation. Mm -hmm. So you pray the answer. And the things that I talked about in there, by the way, this is the coolest nurses organization. They're number one <laughs> in the state of Texas. Texas is yeah. a big stinking state. Yeah, UT Health Partners Nursing Program. And I love it. Uh, so what they're doing is raising money for research grants, they're even into cool things like epigenetics, which I'm very interested in. It's how your genes express themselves um, by the choices you make. They're giving scholarships for nurses. I wouldn't have made it through nursing school without a um, hardship scholarship and then pro endowed professorships. So. Did it make it harder, though? You're going through all of this, finding out where you are health-wise, and you've got the added problem of fame. So you've got magazines and mm -hmm. reporters and TV saying, it's over. Mm -hmm. How, and I'm using this as an extreme case so that people watching can understand, there are ways to, I guess, escape that, those negative messages being mm -hmm. sent to you. How do you do it? For instance, I've never looked at my website. Really? I have no idea. I've never even had the curiosity <laughs> to peek, because that's not who I am. Yeah. I don't think there's anything um, different or special about me. I've never thought that. I actually got into music when I was 36 and actually going to go on and get my MD when Miss Winona 
Zena with the guitar started singing, and I knew that was her destiny. Yeah. And I would never let her get into show business with all of its pitfalls without being there with her. Yeah. But having said that, um, I believe that we're here to um, grow in love and wisdom <clears throat> and to be of service. Yeah. Another part of your story that fascinates me is the abuse that you took, mm. the domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. And there are so many women who feel trapped in it. And I know your story is you got your children and you left. You mm -hmm. got out of it. Mm -hmm. Where did you find that strength? Because what I hear from battered women all the time is when you're in it, you don't realize there's a way out. It was very dramatic, very dramatic. And I know it must be hard for you sitting there right now and my clothes match and I did my hair and I'm the happiest and healthiest I've ever been. It must be hard for people to look at me right now and imagine that I was desperate. <clears throat> it was pitiful because I was so poor. Um, I always worked two jobs, but just minimum wage because I had no education. So I had to be on welfare, which was very degrading. And I could barely keep a jar of peanut butter on the table. So <sighs> you feel you have no self-worth. You have no self-esteem. I thought I was responsible for Brian's death, my parents' divorce. I'd been the town scandal, because I was a town good girl in Ashland, Kentucky, and then all of a sudden I'm pregnant. Um, so it's very true that our self-esteem is the most important thing, because we attract what we feel worthy of. There was a boy next door, and he was gorgeous, and he was like a cowboy. And he began stalking me when I broke up with him. I knew there was something off. So he began stalking me. He actually moved in across the street in an apartment so he could watch me. So one night I came home from work and he'd broken in, um, broke out a window, was hiding. He raped me and he beat me and he shot up heroin in front of me and I had no idea he did that. So when he passed out, I grabbed the kids, and I was a mess. I mean, my battered face was real scary. So we were only two blocks from um, the West Hollywood Sheriff Station. So we showed up there. I get on APB, and I find out at that time he's an ex-con. And we stayed at the Holloway Motel, a wonderful night clerk. Obviously, I had no money. The kids were in their pajamas. He let us spend the night, and that night, whew, that night I looked in the little medicine cabinet mirror. Remember those in the mm -hmm. old hotel? And I realized I didn't recognize myself. My lip was all swollen, my left eye was black, and I thought, my life is as grotesque as this, as this battered face staring back at me. And I didn't recognize myself. And then I started thinking, I know better than this. And that night changed me forever. And I've said that I think it's our personal ground zeros, those moments that really break us open, where we face a catastrophe, a crisis, that make us kind of think, hmm, there's another way of looking at this. And I really assessed my life and understood I had no goals or purpose. And that's when I decided, well, for one thing, I had to leave town because he would have killed me. Um, but I went to the mountaintop back home in Kentucky. We lived for a year without a TV or telephone. <laughs> Which might to some people be the most shocking part of the I story. I know. <laughs> and why and Ashley kept threatening to report me to Child Protective <laughs> Services. <laughs> but that magical year changed all of us. You talk also about how being around people, being in nature, there are certain things you can do to make yourself feel better that helps mm -hmm. give you a stronger self. Yes. And what are some of the other things? It's the well, the American Psychiatric Association discovered after many years of research, um, and I'm always curious, I have to know my source, because I think in media and in journalism and everywhere, um, and I think it's disgusting that we don't um, find out our sources and make sure that we're telling the truth. But they came out with uh, eight traits that exist. And this is in someone who survives uh, a concentration camp, 
Buchenwald, um, Ostwich and all, people who live to be 100 because they survive their spouse, even their children and friends. Um, people who survive catastrophic tornadoes, natural disasters and everything, and there's eight characteristics. So for me, the key one is having an open belief system. I always put that first because nothing's going to change mm -hmm. till we open our mind and are willing to change the way we've been thinking. Number two is the support system. That's huge. Number three is the sense of humor. And I've been timed. Um, they say I can only be serious for three minutes, and then, <laughs> then I'm a goofball. <laughs> then your expiration date on serious comes yeah. up. <laughs> Laughter's critical. Number four is nature. That's why I live on a farm. We have to have our connection with the out great outdoors. Say so God stands for great outdoors. Uh, number five, goals and purposes. We all need something to sort of get us out of bed and create movement and push us along. Um, and you know, I say um, goals and purpose, and I didn't have time today to add one more thing, and that's risks. How critical it is to take risks, because they give you quantum leaps towards your goals. I mean, when I moved to Nashville in 79, I had a 170 bucks yes. in my old plastic purse and a car whose name was Hunk of Junk. <laughs> its primary coat was bonding, and the kids wouldn't even let me take them to school. They make me drop them off a block away. <laughs> and the three of us slept in a single bed of a cheap motel. That's now a crack house. Wow. But see, that's the thing that fascinates me about you, is that there is somewhere in all of this, this drive and belief in yourself that mm. you'll take this risk, you'll try this, you'll do something new. And so many people don't have that. And I wonder if we could bottle it from you, what it mm. would be. Some people are observers of life. Yeah, that's true. And that's just because, um, well, number eight, let me add, is having a spiritual belief system. I'm not religious. I don't go to church. I get really upset with the dogma and the doctrines and the religiosity that says my way is the only way. That didn't work for me. I believe in what C.S. Lewis said, that God is the love that loves all loving. So, um, and you know what? The more I stud study physics, the more I understand that there are multiple universes. One of my gal pals is uh, um, Lisa Randall. She's professor of physics at Harvard, and she is a theorist behind the 11 dimensions. There aren't just three dimensions, length, width, and height, 3D. Mm -hmm. There's <laughs> so what are hiding in those other ones? Oh, isn't that fascinating yeah. to think about? A little mind-boggling to think about, too. It's totally mind-blowing. <laughs> it just sort of puts things in perspective. It's our ego and our ego's need to be in a clique so that it's us against, against them. It's the Muslims against the Jews, the, the Baptists against the Catholics and all that. Mm -hmm. I think any time we claim religious exclusivity, we've lost our the real essence of spirituality, which is that we're all in this together, um, many paths, but only one journey. And whatever you choose to call that, the God of your understanding, as we say in the 12-step program, the world's most successful support group, um, or higher power, um, the more I study physics, the more elegant the universe is, and the bigger God is. So I think the fact that I realize I'm a spiritual being having this human journey. Yeah. Everything has a spiritual solution. It's all designed so we can grow. Last thing before I let you go. By any means, you have raised two very successful children. In your story, you talk about having nothing. So many parents today think the guide to raising successful children is give them this and give them that. What really should they be giving their children? Their time. Yeah? They're, that's why I took them to the mountaintop in Kentucky without any stimulation. 
like I said, without a TV or a telephone. And while we were planning a garden, while we were taking care of animals and hunting ginseng in the woods, um, sitting on the front porch, watching a storm come in from that mountaintop, um, finding their ancestral roots, um, just the simple day-to-day -day things that give shape and definition to life. Um, I guarantee you, the girls will say that that was a magical time in their life. But also, um, and I learned this too late, if there was one thing I could change, it would be to listen more. Well, we have enjoyed listening to you today. Such an honor to have you here with us. Truly a pleasure. I'm a PBS supporter. Well, we're happy to know that too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Naomi Judd. Live well and be well.